All right, this is this has been a, a great message for me to prepare because when I was going over the notes, I just kept thinking to myself, uh, not that this is a job or anything, but this I have the best job of anybody because this message is just so amazing. It's so wonderful. Uh, I've called it for this week, God's superabounding grace. A couple of weeks ago, I used, I had a message called called God's extravagant grace, but now we're going to see grace and its relation to sin. Uh, and we're going to, as we go into chapter six, we're going to look at the question that someone poses to Paul, a critic, someone critiquing what he's preaching, and ask the question, what, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? That's super, super abounding grace. So if we just keep in mind uh, where we've been and at the end of Romans 5, as we're going to Romans 6, we really have to understand that because if you don't have a good grasp of what he is presenting at the end of chapter 5, you're not going to understand how he can say the things he's going to say in chapter 6, 7, and 8. And we'll see that uh, as we work our way through tonight's message. Uh, salvation from God uh, is just so beyond anything humans could come up with, so beyond anything religious systems could come up with, so beyond it, our needs. He, it's extravagant grace, I said a couple of weeks ago. And that's what's, uh, what Christianity really needs to understand. We need to realize that getting saved isn't a small thing. You know what religion says, man-made wisdom and man-made theological systems say that uh, getting saved is our way to get God involved in our things, our way to get God to do what we want. And we hear it all the time. I just heard someone this week saying that once they got saved, uh, God was their co-pilot. Once they're saved, you know, he's kind of like their assistant now. He's going to take, get involved in their things and make them all work out just the way he wants. And of course, that's not Christianity. That's, that's pagan superstition. That's not spiritual Christianity. Spiritual Christianity is recognizing that salvation isn't our way to get God involved in our things. Salvation is God's way to get us involved in his things. And there's a world of difference between that. And uh, as we begin to look at chapter six, uh, it's just going to knock our socks off with the amazing things that he provides for us now as we are brought into that new humanity, brought into the family of God under the headship of Christ. And so we, we won't look back at chapter five right now, but I just wanted to list out the first few points here, just going into uh, as a reminder but what we learned in the last part of cha uh, chapter 5, the, that part uh, explained that Adam's one disobedient act began the reign of sin and death. One act of Adam uh, drew at that one man and his one act. Sin and death entered the world and uh, affected everybody associated with Adam. Everybody associated with Adam, which is all people at that time, everybody associated with Adam was brought under the reign of sin and death. So too, Christ's one obedient act began the reign of righteousness, life, and grace, which is much more. What's easier, taking away life, almost, uh, you know, I'm not recommending this, but almost anyone can take away a life. Uh, just buy a gun or, or use your car improperly or even by accident. It's, it's easy to take a life, but what's Im impossible for a human to do? It's impossible to give life to the dead. It's impossible to do that. That's what Christ did. It goes far beyond uh, the repercussions of Adam's fall and goes far beyond that. Uh, what's easier to do? Do the wrong thing? That's pretty easy. We all know that. Uh, what's the, the harder thing? To do the right thing. And that's what this means when he said we are brought into this righteousness, life, and grace. And it's a much more salvation. In Christ, we're no longer under the reign of sin and death, but under the reign of grace, which brings, brings righteousness and life. Uh, and we saw a couple of verses there. That's where we got our uh, one night. We spent quite a lot of time on reigning in life through righteousness, reigning in life. We reign in life now in the family of God under the headship of Christ because uh, of we're under the reign of grace. And we saw that at the end of the chapter. 
because God deals with humanity and families, that's the whole point in uh, the last part of chapter five. He deals with them, uh, uh, humanity and the two families, the family that's, un and they're each under specific headships. There's the family that belongs to sin and death under the reign, uh, under the reign of sin and death that belongs to Adam one. And there's the headship number two, Adam number two, the Lord Jesus Christ, and now all those associated with him are brought into righteousness and life. And the thing I really want to point out here, and this is going to lead into our question, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? This righteousness and life we have now associated with Christ in the family of God, under the headship of Christ, and everything that's true of Christ becomes true of us. Everything he did on that cross for us now that belongs to him belongs to us. It's automatic. It's, automatic. it's not based on anything we do. It's not based on our works, our effort, our performance. It's not based on uh, anything we can come up with. It's only based on what Christ did. We just receive it by faith. And that's that super abounding gift of grace through Christ and his one work on that cross. He's now uh, a providing a gift of grace, a gift of righteousness, a gift of life. And our only role is to be uh, brought into that by faith. And there, as soon as that happens, we receive everything that belongs to Christ becomes us. Now, of course, I'm not talking about deity or things like that. I'm talking about the things that accrued from his, the one man's one act on that of righteousness on the cross. All that belongs to us automatically. Just think, when you were under Adam, when you were in Adam, when you came into the world, did you have to do anything to uh, come under the reign of sin and death? No, you were brought, you were conceived and born into the world under sin and death. Everything that belonged to Adam one just belonged to you. You didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to uh, perform a certain way. You didn't have to lose something you had before. It just was yours because of your association with Adam one. Well, it's that same idea. Uh, that's the one similarity with Adam, with Christ, is that in the same way, those born into the family of God, those regenerated and brought into the family of God under the headship of Christ, now all those things associated with him and his act of righteousness become ours. We don't do anything. We don't earn them ourselves. We don't gain them by performance. We don't maintain them through our own works or acts. They just belong to us because we have been brought in the family of God under the headship of Christ. And that's what it is. We didn't earn it. We didn't merit it. We didn't deserve it. Uh, it's not based on works or performance. It's just based on Christ and being associated with him. So this is an amazing message, but it brings up a, a point that, uh, that, that the critic is going to bring up at the beginning of chapter 6. And that is, well, then, if grace superabounds where sin abounds, then why don't we just keep on sinning? Why don't we continue to abide in sin so that grace continue to uh, superabound? And that's what uh, we're not going to understand what his answer to that if you don't really have a good grasp of all the implications. Uh, well, I can't say all the implications because it's such an infinite truth. We'll never have all the implications, but a good grasp on the implications of our position in Christ of all that belongs to us, not because of anything about who we are or what we've done or earned or merited or anything like that, but it's all based on who Christ is and what he's done. And now being associated with him, all of that comes to us automatically. And that's that positional truth. And when we realize that, we uh, realize that the goal then of the Christian life is that life then, you can go to the next point, uh, the goal of the Christian life then becomes one of taking what is true of us uh, positionally and bringing it into our experience. Here's, we talked about this a few weeks ago, this positional truth. The last half of Romans 5 there is positional truth. If it's not something we can experience, it's not, not something we earn, it's not something we know about if God didn't tell us about it. We'd never guess it. 
We've never come up with it on our own, but that's our, our position now before God. God. That's why God has to take it and reveal it to us so that we know where we stand in his sight. And when we recognize that, we, uh, it becomes evident that the goal then of Christian living, which he's going to now bring up now in chapter 6 through 8, the goal of the Christian life isn't gaining uh, salvation or blessings. It's not doing things to maintain our salvation or not lose blessings. And it's not meriting a thing so that we can gain more blessings or, or more aspects of salvation. All of that is already given to us 100% in Christ. The goal of the Christian life then becomes simple freedom. The goal of the Christian life becomes one of taking what's already given to us positionally, everything that belongs to us positionally as uh, associated with Christ under his headship, bringing it into our experience. And chapter 6 is going to begin to explain <clears throat> how we do that. Christian growth occurs when we bring more and more of what is true of us positionally in Christ into our experience. Now, I'm just, I prefer the positional and practical or positional and experience. I know some people have learned it as our standing and our state. They're both basically saying the same thing. I'm just, I just, uh, it just seems more natural to me to refer to positional and experience or positional and practical, uh, but that's the same idea as with standing and state. When we understand our position, when we understand our standing uh, as described in the last half of chapter five, where everything for the believer comes to us, not because of anything, of who we are or what we've done, but because of Christ and what he did. And just as everything automatically came to us under Adam one, so namely sin and death, so too now, uh, everything that for those associated with Christ, all believers, Everything comes uh, from Christ to us, namely righteousness, life. That's our standing. That's our position. That's where we are. And now the, the, the maturing in the Christian life is just one simple concept. And I can't reiterate this again because I talk to people and uh, they may very well be Christians and they think Christian life now is trying to maintain the salvation they got or gain more of the salvation, more blessings. Uh, and God started out, starts out salvation by giving you a few blessings, and then if you perform, or you merit, or you act a certain way, or you go through a ritual, or a rite, or you pay enough money to the church, or whatever, you're, whatever you've been told, that then you can gain blessing, gain uh, things from God, gain in your relationship to God. But that is just merely religion. That is not God's word. God's word says that when you receive the gift of righteousness, it brings you into the family of God under the headship of Christ and under Christ's headship, everything that belongs to Christ is, uh, belongs to those associated with him automatically. And now the Christian life is just discovering those things in God's word and uh, allowing or the Holy Spirit to uh, empower us to use them and bring them out into our daily walks and experience. So I just want to, to bring that out because most people don't understand the riches they have in Christ. Uh, I remember a few years ago on, I think it must have been a new show of some kind, and they had the story about a homeless man, and I had a video of him, and uh, he was sitting there living on, just going from street corner to street corner, didn't, have a, didn't think he had a penny to his name. And he just lived, it showed him uh, pulling food out of uh, the uh, garbage bins behind a jewel at uh, other grocery stores. And he just lived like that for years. And all of a sudden, uh, the police came and started talking to him to find out who he was because evidently there were officials looking for him because several years before, he had an uncle, uh, a rich uncle, who died and left him millions of dollars. And this guy's been living, thinking he was a, a pauper, thinking he was in poverty, and, and when in fact he was a, a multimillionaire. 
And it is kind of one of these heartwarming stories as he, he reads it. Well, it's just, it's even more heartwarming be, uh, when we realize our riches in Christ. How many people, how many Christians walk around thinking they have to beg things to get God to do something for them, trying to get God to do something for them, or they need to beg God to give them more blessings or to do something or to answer a prayer. And they just, they're living like paupers have not just millions in the banks but from god's perspective billions and billions infinite resources all the resources of christ himself and yet they live uh like a beggar on the street corner because they don't uh, know about those riches on the one hand or they reject them on the other hand let's just look at one amazing verse that everyone should have memorized because it's fairly short so even i can remember it but I'm going to turn there anyway to make sure I get it right. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter eight, Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse nine. It'd help if I got out of First Corinthians and then the Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians eight, verse nine. Look at this amazing statement he gives to the Korean, to the Corinthians. Uh, For ye know, verse nine. This is, again, if I haven't confused you enough, this is 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was God himself, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye, and notice it's the plural there, it's ye, it's every believer in Corinth, every believer at, 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 around during uh, Paul's time here, every believer everywhere ever since that ye through his poverty might be rich. We are rich in Christ. We have the riches of his grace. That this the very descriptors, we've done a study on this, I think it was back in Romans two, where uh, it talks about that when anybody, including Paul, talks about his apostleship, he always describes it as the riches of God's goodness, the riches of his long suffering, the riches of his forbearance, the rich, and you go to Ephesians, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his grace, the riches of his salvation, especially among the Gentiles, the riches of his power, the riches of his glory. What God's doing today isn't uh, just the expression of his mercy, grace, power, as wonderful as that would, would be. What he's doing today through the apostleship of Paul is dispensing the riches of his glory. And that's why Paul makes such a big point in Romans 2 that if you despise, if you reject what he's doing through Paul's apostleship, you reject the riches of God's goodness. Once you do that, the only place left is the place of judgment. So I just wanted to uh, get the ball rolling with that. At the end of chapter five, if it's not firmly in your mind how rich you are in Christ now, uh, then uh, it might be good to review some of those things because that's what you're gonna need. That's why the critic, if someone's coming along and saying, well then, if all that's true, if God has dispensed all the riches of his grace on us, uh, while we were sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were his enemies, well, why don't we just keep on being ungodly enemies and sinners uh, so that he can even dispense more grace? And of course, Paul, I'll give you the answer right now, but I'm sure you can guess it. He says in our King James, God forbid, may it never be so perish the thought. Don't even let something as absurd as that enter, enter into your thinking. And that's what we're going to pick up on now. Go over to Romans, back to Romans. And one final thing I want to do at the end of chapter 5 here is show you how uh, these last verses in chapter 5, he gives an outline for uh, the uh, next three chapters. He gives an outline for chapter 6, 7, and 8, what he's going to cover. Let's just look. We're not going to read this whole, these whole uh, 10 or 12 verses again, but I just want to show you, uh, correlate each uh, a major section here in the last part of Romans 5 with uh, one of the following chapters, 6, 7, and 8. Look what he says in Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. 
So here we have through Adam, all were enslaved to sin and death. And we've talked about that a lot. I'm just gonna just touch on it here. And what I what the point of what we're doing right now is to show you how each one of these things at the end of chapter five are resolved in one of the following chapters. So here we have the big problem with fallen humanity is that they were enslaved to sin and death. Flip over a page and look at chapter six, and we'll just look at a couple of verses here. Look how this is resolved in chapter six, our enslavement to sin and death. Look at verse seven, chapter six, verse seven. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So somehow between Romans 5, 12 and here, we're gonna learn uh, from God's perspective how he freed us from sin. Verse eight, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. You know, when he sa it says uh, in chapter five, what does he talk about? Uh, sin and death, a reign over you. Well, what's another word for reign? Having dominion over you, being enslaved to you. So the, what was brought up in Romans 5, 12, that through Adam, all were enslaved to sin and death. This is resolved in Romans 6. And when we get to this point, he's, God's going to explain, he's freed us from sin and death. He's freed us from master sin and freed us from bondage to death, from the dominion, from enslavement to death. That's in Romans 6. Flip back a page and let's, let's see, uh, we'll bring in chapter 7. Look at verse 13 now. Look what he talks. He kind of goes on a side thing here. He breaks into his thought and, and cover, talks about something secondary here, a, a second issue. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed uh, when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression even for those who hadn't committed, uh, 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 brought about death because they broke a law, broke a command to God. For 2,500 years, mankind wasn't under a law system. And uh, they, so therefore they couldn't break a command. God didn't give them a command to break. Therefore, sin wasn't being credited to their account, but they all died anyway. So there had to be another reason. Uh, for their death, and that was comes through Adam's transgression. Go over to verse 18. 18. Therefore, as by, or no, not 18. That's not the right verse. Oh, verse, verse 20. It should have verse 20 there for your notes. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. See, what's religion say? What does human wisdom say? What does worldly wisdom say? They say, if you want to uh, restrain sin, if you want to reduce sin, then you put people under a law. But God and Paul say here, putting Israel, putting Adam or putting Israel under a law system, all it did to a sinner, all it did to fallen humanity, all it can do for people who are, who are enslaved to sin and death, all it can do is magnify their sin, make sin abound, the transgressions abound, turn transgressions, or to, excuse me, turn sin into transgressions so that they, it can be a, 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 a assigned a punishment and be assigned a punishment and be, be brought onto them. So for by one man's, or for choice, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace superabounded. Now let's see what how this is resolved over in chapter seven. Chapter seven, and look at verse six. Chapter seven, verse six. But now, Paul's famous, but one of Paul's famous but nows, we are delivered. Another way for deliver is set free from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter what israel showed that being under the law did not free them to free them to uh commit less sin it didn't free them to do righteousness it just enslaved them to sin magnified their sin multiplied their transgressions what Israel and what all Jews and what anybody under any kind of law system needs who's a fallen sinner is to be set free 
from the law. This is one of the most shocking uh, verses in all the Bible because it's counter to everything according to human wisdom. It's counter to all riddle religious systems. It's counter to all that. Uh, freeing people to serve God doesn't come by putting them under a law. Freeing people to serve God comes by putting them under grace. And we're going to see how that plays out in, in chapter 7 and on uh, through chapter 8. Now let's look at one other final point from chapter 5. This time go to verse, uh, I guess we'll pick it up at 16. So now we've seen we're, our biggest problems were enslaved to sin and death. That's resolved in chapter 6. We are, especially Israel was the only one under the law. So the Jews specifically and, and God-fearing Gentiles who associated with them are now freed from the law to serve God. And now look at verse 16. And not as it was by, we're back in chapter 5. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. Also belonging to us under the headship of Adam 1 is judgment and condemnation. Look down at verse uh, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men unto condemnation. Even so, the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So our next big problem is that we're also under judgment and condemnation before God. Now go to chapter 8. He's going to resolve this. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. There, there is therefore now no condemnation. He just told us under Adam 1 in chapter 5, we were under judgment and condemnation. Now there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. Notice there we have that deliverance concept, that being made free uh, from the law of sin and death. That's, and that when you come out of that, you have the victorious Christian life. You have uh, now a life uh, that uh, can serve God and to walk in a way that's well-pleasing to him. Look at, while you're in chapter 8 there, look down at verse 11. Well, let's start at verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and, and this isn't a, a possibility, if you're a believer, this is, this is a, a certainty, and, and many people translate that since, but since the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Make alive your bodies. Use our bodies uh, uh, for God and his purposes in a way that's well-pleasing to him. And it's all by that spirit dwelling in us and him using God's truth for today to empower us to walk in a way that's pleasing to God. So that's the outline we're going to be looking at. Everything associated with, he's going to explain how everything associated with Adam 1 was resolved in Adam 2, in the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's going to show that uh, the, us, we, when we were enslaved to sin, Christ, uh, through his cross work, resolved that and set us free from sin and death. We, those who were under the law, well, it was impossible as long as they were under that law, the only thing that happened as sinners was their sin was magnified. And this is going to be resolved in chapter 7. And we're, they'll be freed from that law. And then they can serve God. And then standing judged and condemned before God, that's resolved in Romans 8. And when we get uh, by being freed from judgment and condemnation, and when we get out that door, all, got, all Paul's left with is the end of Romans 8, which is an a awesome, amazing uh, certainty of salvation, uh, unchangeable. And he, he ends that passage by saying, because this is all based on Christ and who he is, it's absolutely certain our salvation. Everything he's done for us, we can't get more. He's given us all. We can't lose it. We didn't get it by uh, doing something. We can't lose it by not doing something or doing the wrong thing. It all belongs to us 
in Christ. It all belongs to us in the family of God under the headship of, of Christ. Everything that belongs to us belongs to Christ. And he closes Romans 8 and he says, what can change that? And he goes through everything in the physical world. Then he goes through everything in the spiritual world. And then he goes with concrete things like people and things. And then he goes to, to uh, uh, not concrete things like thoughts and, and uh, experiences and things like that. And no matter what it is, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then he takes, then you think that was good enough. That pretty much says it all. But he takes it one step further at the end of Romans 8. And he says, not even God himself separated us of Christ. That's where we're going with this message. That's why uh, this message is uh, the most astounding message in the universe. That's, this is what uh, empowers a Christian life. This is what leads to infinite and eternal things. This is the most magnificent, wonderful, amazing thing in the universe. Uh, this is what should be having on Zoom millions and billions of viewers, not because of me or because of our assembly, but just because of this message that offers so much that I freely gives all this simply on the base of receiving by faith. The free, the superabounding gift of righteousness come from the one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his one act of righteousness on that cross. And so that's where we're going in these next three chapters. So let's go ahead and go back to Romans 5. Romans 5. And we're leading into this question about continuing in sin. So we'll go back, pick it up at verse 20 and 21, and that'll lead us into verse 1 of chapter 6. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's what that whole last part of chapter 5 is about. Everything that Adam did wasn't just counteracted by something of equal value or equal importance. It was uh, overwhelmed. It was super abounded. It was avalanched over. It was overwhelmed. It was washed away. It was uh, beyond anything Adam did. It's super abounding grace. It far exceeded what Adam, what Christ uh, gained for believers is uh, far exceeded anything lost through Adam's fall. Moreover, the law entered, verse 20, uh, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign, or under the reign of grace, which means that through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And we have to tie this up with one verse we read so we don't forget it off of verse 17. This reign of grace uh, does something for us. Look at verse 17. For if one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. We're just not released uh, from the, the uh, mastership and the, the subjection to sin and death, we're made reigners in life because we're under the reign of grace. And uh, we can't really uh, comprehend that in all its fullness, but we can certainly comprehend it and grow in our comprehension of that every day as we learn about these things, uh, Paul's epistles, and we learn about all that God's accomplishing through Paul's apostleship. So what is the proper response to the superabounding grace through the person and work of Christ? Verse 1, chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What a thing. Look what, look what Paul says just in two, two simple words here. God forbid. May it never be so. Perish uh, the thought. Strike it from your thinking. Don't even let it come into your uh, thinking. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is a liberty to serve God, having been freed from sin, death, the law, and condemnation. You don't know how many times I've been telling people, and I share it with anybody who will listen, and sometimes, uh, hopefully I'm not trapping people, but so sometimes I just do it, 
and uh, see where it goes. And you don't know how many times I've shared this with people and their first response uh, is that if you teach grace like that, then it leads to sin. And especially it seems like uh, the more it's certain that the person is a Christian, the more <clears throat> he tends to react this way. If there's a fear that this preaching grace uh, will result in sin, that it incites sin. I remember talking to a pastor uh, who actually said he was a, he believed the great in the, the a grace message and the distinct apostleship of Paul, but he says he could never teach grace uh, superabounding this pure grace concept because the people in his pews uh, would just use it to sin. Now I don't know if that says more of something about him or the people in his pew. But this pure grace is not a license, it's not a motive, it's not an excuse to sin. It's a liberty to serve God. It's a liberty to finally be able to do what we couldn't do before. It's not a license to sin. It's a, a, a way to use to gain liberty from sin, death, the law, and condemnation. Now, uh, one of the things we can use to think of this, I always try to think of uh, some examples. They're usually pretty homely, but sometimes it helps get the point across here on these uh, divine truths. And I remember once years ago watching a, a TV show, I think it was, and uh, it was about soldiers' response when they uh, were, were uh, defeated the Nazis and were entering into various concentration camps. And one of the main things I remember from way back then is they were amazed at how many of the people who were in the concentration camps just wanted to stay there. They didn't want to leave. They threw open the gates and they stayed in the concentration camp. They didn't know anything else. They didn't, they've been so uh, defeated and destroyed and uh, demeaned. And so, uh, so the environment there is so destructive. They, many of them were brought as children. Maybe they never even knew anything else. And they didn't even know how to leave. They didn't even, the gates are thrown open, but they didn't even know what they were supposed to do. Uh, the freedom actually made them afraid. They were afraid of freedom, and they were waiting and wouldn't leave the concentration camp. It was all they knew, uh, and they were defeated, uh, completely defeated physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, and uh, they were uh, afraid of this freedom. And unfortunately, uh, that's a large part of Christianity's afraid to go out into the freedom. They've been under the rule of sin and death. They've been associated with Adam one, maybe 10 years of their lives, 20, 30, 40, 50. And now they've been set free from that. That's all they ever knew. And they're not sure how to go forward. That's why uh, teaching the word rightly divided is so critically important because the only way you're gonna know as a believer what you're supposed to do with the freedom Christ has uh, procured, for, procured for you on the cross comes through divinely revealed scripture and the Holy Spirit using that scripture to empower you to walk in a way that's pleasing to God. It's the what's going to encourage you to enter into that life. And that life might look scary now. Uh, that life for the person, especially some of the people in the concentration camp, freedom almost looked scarier uh, than the concentration camp. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to proceed. Now, how would they survive out there? They've been uh, surviving in here. How would they survive out there? And, uh, and how would that work? And unfortunately, there's so many Christians who cling to the flesh, who cling to the old man, who cling to that old Adam. It's all they ever knew. And they assume God's working in a similar way to the old man, to the old Adam. Another example of that, I, I remember reading one time, repeat criminals. Evidently, there's a problem with some criminals who deliberately commit a crime because they'd rather be in jail where everything's taken care of, where they don't have to worry about anything, where they, they're taken care of, and they get released, and they actually commit another crime then just to get back in jail. And how many uh, Christians uh, do that? They, they want to go back to where they were in the flesh. They want to go back to where they were under Adam 1, instead of moving on to the responsible uh, freedom and liberty that comes through Christ. 
And that only comes through rightly dividing the scriptures. There is a note here that I'll just bring out this grace is liberty. You know, there's a difference uh, between liberty and freedom uh, that probably uh, the political establishment could really uh, spend a little time thinking about, especially these days. But freedom is just freeing you to do uh, basically what you want. But that's not liberty. Liberty is freedom uh, with responsibility. Free liberty is responsible freedom, using freedom in a responsible and positive manner. That's what grace does. It's liberty. It's not just freedom to do what you want. It's freedom to do what God wants. It's freedom to act responsibly in the sight of God. And we learn that from his word. Let's go and look at one passage that uh, is particularly instructive when it comes to grace and what grace does. Go over to Titus 2. Titus 2. Titus 2, verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11. And let's just look at the superabounding grace. And does it, uh, is it something that incites sin or does it do something else? Let's look at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. This uh, grace of God that brings salvation it's now uh, been broadcast, it's been made known, it's been out there, it brings salvation to all men, and of course on the basis of grace and faith. And now look what it does. It's not that it incites sin. What does it do instead, verse 12? Teaching us, grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that's what it teaches us. The first thing uh, that grace is gonna do, it's gonna begin to uh, un get us to unlearn some things. We have to unlearn all those things associated with uh, the old Adam, with the old man, with the flesh, with sin and death. All those things we learn from that. We might be 60 years old when we're saved and all those things for 60 years that have been part of our thinking, part of our manner, part of our ways, and we have to begin to unlearn those uh, and stop uh, and actually deny them and unlearn them. Ungodliness and worldly lusts, that's what grace does. It teaches us how to do it. And how does it teach us how to do that? How does a person unlearn something? How does a person deny something? So those are negatives. And when we unlearn or, or deny something, uh, just try it sometime unlearn something just through brute force, just through force of will. And you're just going to say, I'm not going to do this act, or I'm not going to think this thing. And uh, you know, that might last for a minute or two, but it doesn't, the vacuum, if it's not filled with something else, the vacuum will just pull it back in and there'll be that thought or that act again. The key to how grace works is that it just doesn't give you the negative. It just doesn't tell you to throw a uh, certain knowledge away and uh, deny certain acts and that kind of thing. It says, to, and when you put those away, you fill that space back in with verse, uh, the rest of verse 12 here, with living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now he brings in the positive side. He, he brings in this filling now. You're denying the things, you're unlearning the things you had before, and you're learning the things through grace in order to uh, to live soberly. That's with regard to yourself. That's how you conduct yourself. You know, one of the fruit of the Spirit is that uh, self-control. That's soberly. That's you. That's, the, that's you uh, within yourself. Then righteously. That's how you interact with others. So grace teaches you how to live soberly, how to live self-control, how to live in accord with God and His Word. And that will then affect uh, how you interact with others, how you rightly act with others, and that leads to, uh, and that leads to how you relate to God. So this covers every aspect of your life: your relationship with yourself, your relationship with others, and your relationship with God. And it's, it's your whole life, your whole being, and it's all 
I'll train brought on by grace. You're going to unlearn and deny some things, but you're not just going to do that out of forceful will. You're going to replace them with God's things. You're going to replace them with God's acts. Let's just uh, see how this all comes together by going back to Romans, and we will probably go ahead and finish there then. Go back to Romans, Romans 1. And you're keeping this verse in Titus in the back of your mind because we're going to see a lot of uh, comparable things here. Look at verse, 17, uh, verse 18. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. What were we just reading about in Titus 2? We were reading there about denying ungodliness and living righteously. So this is a problem. We, in the last half of Romans 1 describes the plight of fallen humanity who's, fallen, who's uh, followed the pattern of unbelief that leads to sin and death. And here his basic problem is that he's uh, associating with ungodliness, unrighteousness. And look what he's been handed over to. Remember in Titus it said uh, worldly lusts. Look at verse 24, Romans 1, 24. Wherefore God also gave up, gave them up to uncleanness through lusts of their own heart, to dishonor <clears throat> their own bodies uh, between themselves. There we have that lust concept. That's the plight of fallen humanity. They're in, uh, enslaved to ungodliness and unrighteousness and belong to sin and death. And now what controls their thinking, what controls their actions? Are the lust of the heart, lust of the world, lust of the eyes, lust of the heart, lust. And that's what uh, grace is going to counteract. That's what grace is going to allow us to deny. That's what grace is going to teach us to replace uh, with to replace those things with God's things. Now go to chapter 12 of Romans. We're just going to do a little chain of uh, verses here. That's our plight. That's that being enslaved to unrighteousness, ungodliness, sin and death, lust of the heart, lust of the world. And now look what he, now look what the answer of that is. Here we have the answer to that problem. Chapter 12 verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, uh, which is your reasonable service. That's very similar to in Titus when he was talking about living soberly and righteously and godly. That whole reasonable service and service here. Uh, refers to worship service. This is the way, uh, one of the ways we praise God. One of the ways we, uh, we uh, worship God is through uh, allowing him to work in and through our bodies. But how is it done? Verse 2. Remember in Titus, it was uh, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Verse 2 here, and be not conformed to this world, the place those lusts come from, the worldly lusts. Be not conformed to this world. And in uh, Titus, remember it said, in this present world, in Galatians, it calls it this present evil world, where those lusts, sinful lusts originate. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's the key. How does this happen? It, it's denying ungodliness, unlearning the things we learned under uh, Adam 1, in association with the flesh and Satan and sin and death unlearning those things and uh, the things of this world not being uh, be but be transformed by the renewing of your mind the only way to do this is to renew your mind the only way to be trained the only way to deny the only way to unlearn is not just a negative it's a positive as you learn the new things of god as you renew your mind with god's things that will just push out the old things under Adam. That will push out uh, the things of this world. That will push out the things of ungodliness and unrighteousness. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, of course, the, the $20 million question is, what do you renew your mind with? If you get any, if you talk to people, you'll get as many different answers as the people you talk to. But Paul's very clear here on what you renew 
your mind with. Look at verse one. What's he tell them to read, to operate according to? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So it's the mercies of God that he, that we are supposed to be renewing our minds with based on those, these mercies of God. Well, that just begs another question. What are the mercies of God? I want to ask someone about the mercies of God. And he, and he thought it was kind of like people use the terminology of grace, the grace of God. And, you know, they just mean that, you know, if they get the parking spot they want, it's by the grace of God. Or, uh, he was talking about just nearly missing a car accident. He thought someone was going to rear end him. And then in the last second, the car veered off onto the side of the road and he he was saying that was because of the mercy of god well see that is not what god and paul are talking here uh, at all these this mercy of god is he explains just a couple of verses before this so we're, we're actually working our way back through <laughs> through this passage but when we come out the end i think we'll be able to tie it all together so it's this mercies of god that's to renew our mind and what are the mercies of god look up at verse 30 verse 30. He tells you, and this is chapter 11, chapter 11, just a few verses before this, he says, for as ye in times past uh, have not believed God, yet now, and of course the ye there are the Gentiles, Gentiles in Rome, uh, ye in times past have not believed God, yet now ye, the Gentiles, as he's referring to here, obtain mercy through there, that's Israel, the Jews' unbelief. Now, that's an important critical thing, especially for some of the new people here. This is an announcement. God is announcing here through Paul he's doing something completely different than he ever talked about before. Everything else in the Old Testament, everything else in the gospel accounts of Christ's ministry, earthly ministry, everything in, the, uh, in Acts with regard to Peter and the Twelve, they all had to do with the Gentiles being blessed with Israel and through her faith. God said, God raised up Paul now, and he's blessing the Gentiles apart from Israel and through her unbelief. Two totally different programs, totally mo two different modus operandi, and uh, two totally different things. Well, now let's go back to this mercy concept. Notice he says it, there's a display of his mercy, verse uh, 32, or excuse me, verse 31. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they may also obtain mercy. Do you see all the mercy going on here? These are the mercy he's talking about in, in chapter 12, verse 1, these mercies. For God, verse 32, hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on all. And uh, based on the fact that this is something that is completely different, it's distinct, uh, it's the way, it's a special way God is revealing his mercy, uh, the extending, dispensing, I guess would be the best word, the riches of his mercy through Paul's apostleship now up from Israel through her fall in unbelief. And what does Paul call this? We're going to make one more backward plunge into chapter 11 and just see what Paul calls this in chapter 25. And remember, we're starting this all with renewing our mind. We renew our mind with the mercies of God, and the mercies of God are what he's dispensing now through the apostleship of Paul in verse 25 of chapter 11. And what does Paul call this? What does God call this? Because this is God's word. For I would not, uh, not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. It's the mystery. That's the only thing that's going to result in the renewing of our mind today in a way that proves the good and acceptable will of God. It brings us into uh, God and his plans and purposes, this mystery, uh, this mystery truth. And all that's involved with that, that what's going to do this. And we see this, we, uh, Romans opens with this and closes with this. And that's how I'll finish off the message here. Let's just see where Romans opens with this. Go to the chapter one of Romans. Now let's put this all together. The only thing that's going to renew our minds are the mercies that God is now dispensing through the unique and distinct apostleship of Paul that's called the mystery. And this is why this is the only thing that will work for believers today. Go to chapter 1, 
where he introduces this, chapter 1, and go to verse 11. Romans 1, verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you, ye, ye all, this is for all of them, ye may be established. You may be set on firm ground. You may be strengthened. You may be established on a firm foundation. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by mutual faith, both of you and me. The only way we're going to have mutual faith, the only way we're going to operate in a way that pleases God, is to receive this spiritual gift that Paul brings, because that's the only thing that brings establishment of believers today. Let's close by looking at what he calls that, how he describes that, and now at the end of the book of Romans. Romans 16, 25, Romans 16, 25. And we can go to a lot of other verses, but Romans 16, 25 just says it all in uh, very brevity of terms. So look at verse 24. Uh, notice we're still talking about God's grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. Now, remember in uh, chapter one, he talked about the spiritual gift that would establish them. Now look at verse 24. Uh, verse 25, now to him that is a power to establish you, there we have our word again, build you up, to set you on a firm foundation, to bring you firmly into God's plans and purposes, uh, to establish you, and what's it according to? What is the only thing that will establish a believer today? Uh, it'll be according to my, and you got to take the my there seriously, uh, it's Paul's gospel, the good news of the death burial, resurrection of Christ, uh, and all that that accomplished, and according to that good news, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, uh, according to the revelation of the, uh, excuse me, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. That's the spiritual gift that he said in chapter one can uh, establish them, strengthen them. That's the only way we're going to be able to uh, live the life uh, and walk a walk that's well-pleasing to God. It's the only thing that can renew our minds today in a way that allows us to find the good and pleasing and, and perfect will of God. And that's the, my gospel, Paul's gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. You can't find it in the Old Testament. You can't find it in Jesus's earthly ministry in the Gospels. You can't find it in the ministry of Peter and the Twelve. It was kept secret uh, since the beginning of the world until God revealed it to and through the Apostle Paul. And that's what grace teaches today. That's what renews our mind. That's what strengthens us and establishes us uh, to, for, in, in his good and perfect will. That's what empower, the Holy Spirit uses to empower us to walk in a way that's well-pleasing to him. And that's where we'll, we'll stop tonight. Didn't quite get through all the notes here, but we'll pick it up there next week.